Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 8, World Saviors, The Lost Word, Its Hidden Meaning, by George H. Steinmetz. Chapter 7, World Saviors. The sequence of this and the two succeeding chapters present a rather vexing problem. Logically, it seems preferable to discuss the Messiah concept as a concept, to explore the origin which brought about these legends into existence before turning to the narratives of the individual world saviors. However, such treatment presents an outstanding difficulty. The lives of the saviors chosen for discussion have parallels to which it is desired to call attention and from which it is hoped to formulate certain conclusions. It is thought the reader will profit the more by having the recital of the legends precede such discussion, and we have therefore adopted that sequence. Research has revealed the stories of many saviors in legends and myths of the world. Space prohibits a discussion of even a majority of them, and we have therefore chosen three as most representative. We briefly review the legends of Krishna, Osiris, and Jesus. Preceding the discussion of the Haramic legend and the Messiah concept, and passing reference will be made to such others as it seems desirable to mention. Krishna The story of Krishna is recounted in the Vedas of the Hindus. These sacred books are said to have been committed to writing from as early as 1500 BC, but some occultists claim the Vedas are 50,000 years old. We need not here enter into that controversy, and it is merely mentioned to focus attention on their admitted antiquity. Krishna was born of the virgin Deva Ki. The Atharva Veda says, as Deva Ki wandered in the forest, voices sang from behind the foliage, Hail to thee, glorious Deva Ki, the pure fluid emanating from the mighty soul of all things, shall come, crowned with light, and the stars shall pale before its splendor. It shall come, and life shall challenge death. It shall restore youth to all beings. It shall come sweeter than honey, purer than the spotless lamb, or the mouth of a virgin, and all hearts shall be transported with raptures of love. Glory, glory to thee, Diva Ki. Note the introduction of the analogy of the lamb with purity, thousands of years prior to the Hebrew scriptures. One day in the forest, in the glory of a flashing beam of light, the sons of sons appeared to her in human form, seeing herself overshadowed by the spirit of the universe. Diva Ki lost consciousness and conceived the divine child. On recovering consciousness, a voice informed her, Thou hast conceived in purity of heart and divine love. Thou shalt give birth to a son, destined to be the savior of the world. Shortly after the birth of Krishna, his mother is forced to flee with her infant from the kingdom of King Kansa, her uncle, to escape his murderous intentions. It seemed there existed a prophecy that Devaki should give birth to a son who would grow to manhood, overcome King Kansa, and ascend his throne. As Kansa had killed several previous children of Diva Keys, she remained in hiding upon the birth of Krishna. It is not our intention to herein write a commentary on Hindu philosophy, but the apparent discrepancy of the virgin Devi Ki having given birth to other children seems needful of explanation. The previous children were all of miraculous conception by the spirit of the universe. Hence, she remained a virgin in the respect she had never experienced carnal intercourse. The epic of Krishna and the Vedas is sustained allegory. King Kansa 
Devaki, and for that matter, Krishna, are all symbolic of forces and principles. The seven sons of Devaki, born before Krishna and murdered Vakansa, are the seven centers of energy evolved or rendered objective by the action of Fohat upon that one element. Blavatsky explains, There are in truth the Sephiroth of the Kabbalist, the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost in the Christian system, and in a mystical sense, the seven children or sons of Devaki, killed before the birth of Krishna Vakansa, we have to part or separate from them before we can reach the Krishna or Christ state and center ourselves entirely in the highest, the seventh or the one. See The Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, page 604. This is the same type of inconsistency as encountered in the Christian religion, wherein Jesus is said to have been conceived by the Holy Ghost, and yet considerable genealogy is advanced to prove Joseph to be a descendant of David, thereby indicating Jesus to be of the house royal of Israel. Being unable to find Devaki and the babe, Krishna, Kansa ordered all male infants in his realm slaughtered. Krishna spent his childhood with his mother in the mountainous country, whither she had gone for refuge among the shepherds. Even as a child, legend credits him with performing many miracles. When he was 15 years of age, his mother left him, and in seeking her he went up into the mountains where he was suddenly confronted by an old man in the white robes of an anchorite who informed him his mother had gone, to him who is unchangeable. Shall I see her again? asked Krishna. Yes, when the daughter of the serpent drives the son of the bull to crime. In that day shall thou kill the bull and crush the serpent's head. This is an astrological allusion to the Bull of Taurus and the Serpent of Scorpio. The narrative continues with the story of Krishna's life and teaching, finally relating that he allowed himself to be captured by his enemies, bound to a tree and shot with an arrow. Other accounts relate he was first shot with the arrow and his body then nailed to a tree, being described as omniscient and omnipotent. It may be asked how Krishna's enemies were able to capture and overcome him. The Vedas consistently explain this by stating that he used his power to prevent his enemies accomplishing their purpose until he had completed his earthly mission. It is clearly stated that only through the death of Krishna can humanity be saved, and Krishna himself is quoted as informing his followers that he must sacrifice himself for the benefit of mankind, that they might be saved through his death. It is the teaching of the Vedas that Krishna shall again come to earth as the benefactor and savior of the human race. Osiris The early Egyptians envisioned a second, Mao, flowing beneath the earth from the sea to the first cataract and thence issued from two caverns, the water of their life-giving river, says Breasted. It will be seen that for the people among whom this myth arose, the world ended at the first cataract. All that they knew beyond was a vast sea. This was also connected with the Nile in the south, and the river returned to it in the north. For this sea, which they called the Great Circle, surrounded their earth. It is the idea inherited by the Greeks, who called the sea Okeanos, or ocean. In the beginning, only this ocean existed, upon which there then appeared an egg, or as some said, a flower, out of which issued the sun god. From himself he begat four children, Shu and Tefnut, Keb and Nut. All these, with their father, lay upon the ocean of chaos. When Shu and Tefnot, 
who represent the atmosphere, thrust themselves between Keb and Nut, they planted their feet upon Keb and raised Nut on high. So Keb became the earth and Nut the heavens. Keb and Nut were the father and mother of the four divinities, Osiris and Isis, Set and Nephthys. Osiris The god is represented emblematically as a man with a bull's head, hieroglyphically denoting the sun and Taurus. In one hand, he holds the symbol of eternal life. In the other, the emblem of power above which appears the name of the god in hieroglyphics, which, by a singular coincidence, is composed almost entirely of Masonic emblems. Illustration and note from Stellar Theology and Masonic Astronomy. The beginning of the Osiran legend predates 4000 BC, although it was greatly embellished as time went on. For our purpose, we merely wish to establish its inception in antiquity and are not necessarily concerned with that increment of detail which it gained through the centuries. There is some question among authorities whether Osiris was originally thought to be a god who descended to earth and ruled as a human king, or a king who ascended to heaven and became a god. In any event, he was recognized as a god and according to Breasted, the most popular in the Egyptian pantheon. Osiris succeeded the sun god as king on earth, aided in his government by Isis, his sister wife. He was the benefactor of humanity and a righteous ruler, deciding to travel that he might benefit mankind the more. He left his kingdom in charge of Isis, his wife. During his absence, his brother Set, the principal of evil, conspired against him and prepared a beautiful chest, which was made exactly to the measurements of Osiris. On the return of Osiris, Set gave a banquet in his honor, and having the chest brought into the banquet hall, announced that it was to be a gift for the guest whom it best fitted. One after another, the guest lay down in the chest, but all were too tall or too short, until Osiris was invited to try. No sooner had Osiris laid down than Set and his companions closed the cover upon him, fastened it securely, and threw it into the Nile. It floated down the Nile to Byblos on the Phoenician coast and lodged against a small shrub. This shrub miraculously grew into a great tree, surrounding the chest containing the body of Osiris and the tree. Being discovered by the king of that country was cut down and made into a column to adorn his palace. When Isis heard of the murder of her beloved husband, she sat out in search of the body. Eventually, through the aid of her sister, Nephthys, she learned the body was in the column in the palace of the king of Byblos. She applied to the king for the position of governess to his children and finally, after performing her duties in such a manner as to endear herself to the monarch, informed him of her identity and told him that the body of Osiris was in the great column of his palace. The king thereupon rewarded her faithful services by granting her request for the column from which she removed the body. Isis departed with the body for Egypt, intending more decent internment, but she reckoned without the vengeful set. He stole the body and this time, to make certain of the destruction of Osiris, cut it into 28 pieces, which he scattered to the four winds of heaven. The firm belief of the Egyptian in the resurrection of the body is doubtless responsible for the emphasis which the legend places on the determined efforts of Set to destroy the body of Osiris. Isis patiently hunted for the pieces and found 27, but the 28th, the Phalus, could not be found. 
The phallus, being the organ of reproduction, exoterically it is understood that Osiris could not reproduce. Esoterically, it symbolizes the spiritual, the life giver. Thus, symbolically, we are informed that without the spiritual regeneration, rebirth is impossible. It had been thrown into the Nile, where it was swallowed by fish. Not pertinent to our present purpose, but of interest to the Masonic student is the fact that the phallus of Osiris was swallowed by a fish. Also, the idea of a substitute is intriguing when the esoteric significance of the phallus is considered. She, however, reassembled the 27 parts and fashioned a substitute for the phallus of pure gold. Isis and Horus Illustration from Stellar Theology and Masonic Astronomy The story is a bit vague as to a sequence, but at some time, Isis hid from Set in the swamps of the Nile and gave birth to a son, Horus, who was to be the avenger of his father. Horus grew to manhood, sought out Set, and engaged him in combat. In some narratives, he slays Set, in others, he overcomes him and cast him into the bottomless pit. These tales are rather conflicting, but the general thesis is the overcoming of the evil principle by the son of the god, the triumph of the forces of enlightenment over those of darkness and error. Breasted relates that Osiris, when lying dead, had become a soul by receiving from his son Horus the latter's eye, wrenched from the socket in his conflict with Set. Horus, recovering his eye, gave it to his father, and on receiving it, Horus at once became a soul. From that time, any offering to the dead was commonly called the Eye of Horus, and thus might produce the same effect as on Osiris. From the Dawn of Consciousness, page 48. In one version, the remnant of Osiris is brought about by the powerful charms of Isis, and no mention of the Eye of Horus is made. In any event, Osiris is reanimated and, according to Breasted's translation of one version, he regained the use of his limbs and, although it was impossible for the departed god to resume his earthly life, he passed down in triumph as a living king to become lord of the netherworld. The Eye of Horus, Wilkinson's Ancient Egypt from Stellar Theology and Masonic Astronomy. A chapter of the pyramid text tells us the whole story of the resurrection of the dead god. Over and over again, the rising of Osiris is reiterated as the human protest against death found insistent expression in the invincible fact that he rose. We see the tomb opened for him. The brick are drawn for thee out of the great tomb. And then, Osiris awakes. The wary god wakens. The god stands up. He gains control of his body. Stand up. Thou shalt not end. Thou shalt not perish. Jesus. So familiar should all readers be with the life of Jesus that it would be a waste of time and space to recount it here, were it not for the fact that it is desired to emphasize certain claims regarding him as well as certain events which the New Testament relates. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is with child by the Holy Ghost. Joseph was minded to put her away privily, but he is informed by the angel of the Lord, who appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, 
and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It is the well-remembered Christmas story of how the wise men came from the east asking, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? How Herod the king had heard these things, was exceedingly wroth, and set forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof, from two years and under. How Jesus escaped, because the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Biblical quotations are from Matthew chapter 1 and 2, King James Version. When Jesus was twelve years old, his parents, as was the custom, went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. On the return journey, missing the boy, they searched for him for three days and finally found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Luke chapter 2, 46 and 47. Jesus is sometimes mystically referred to as the widow's son. This is susceptible of two interpretations as Joseph is not mentioned in the Gospels at any time after the narrative of Jesus' ministry is begun, it is presumed he is dead, which would in fact make Mary the mother of Jesus a widow. Likewise, Mary is a widow if the theory of the Immaculate Conception is accepted, for her husband is not a living human being. Jesus was baptized by John and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was subjected to three temptations. He began his ministry, going about the country, teaching his philosophy of love, healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind, doing good to all. Finally returning to Jerusalem, he celebrates the Passover with his disciples foretells for them his fate and goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he permits himself to be betrayed and captured. We must say permits advisedly, for we are informed in the scriptures that he did nothing to prevent his fate. Although he is credited with omniscience, he is tried and crucified, buried in the tomb, which is sealed by the Romans with a great stone. His disciples, later coming to the tomb, find the stone rolled away. The angel informs them, He is risen. We are later told that he ascended into heaven. Of his twelve disciples, Jesus is betrayed by one, Judas, denied by a second, Peter, and doubted by a third, Thomas, who would not believe him to be the Lord until... I put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. John chapter 20 We have reviewed the outstanding events in the lives of three of the saviors. There are many more saviors in recorded history. Prometheus of Greek mythology, taking pity on humanity, brought down fire from heaven and taught man its use. Esoterically, Fire is symbolical of the spiritual, hence immortality. Thus, it is seen that Prometheus conferred the gift of immortality upon humanity. Mystically, he did so too soon, at a time in man's evolution before he was ready for such knowledge. Therefore, he was punished for his act of philanthropy by Zeus. And the punishment continued until man reached the level where it is consistent with universal law that he have such knowledge. This angered Zeus, who caused Prometheus to be bound or crucified on the pinnacle of Mount Caucasus, where he was condemned to suffer in agony with a vulture, tearing and eating his liver until a 
man shall perform the twelve labors. This is purely an astrological illusion. It is the thesis of the teaching of karma and reincarnation that man is born time and time and time again. Each reincarnation or rebirth is under one of the signs of the zodiac successively. Hence, to reach perfection, man must perform the twelve labors, i.e., be born and labor through a material life time under each of the zodiacal signs. Astrologically, this is depicted by Hercules or humanity performing his twelve labors, upon the completion of which Prometheus is freed. Buddha, too, was said to have been crucified, although this is purely symbolical, as all accounts relate his natural death at a ripe old age. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.